It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. The stone the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you, give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has given us light. Bind the fe festal procession with branches up to the horns of the altar. In the early church, all of those various verses from Psalm 118 were recalled as the people of God reflected upon the day that Jesus enters Jerusalem at the start of what we today call Holy Week on this Palm Sunday. More about that a bit later, but even if you already have a palm with you that one of the ushers gave to you at the back of the church, as we sing our opening hymn, as you're willing and able, please raise your palm branches as we sing Hosanna, loud Hosanna, number 218. Please rise. On behalf of the Knox elders, welcome to worship at Knox Church. My name is Jim Pott, and I am the minister here. Please find a seat. Special welcome to people who are visiting with us today, either in person or if you're joining us online as well. Thank you also for joining us. We begin with an opening prayer. And then we'll conclude that prayer with the words that are printed in our bulletins, the prayer of Jesus, the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. God of heaven, come down to earth in Jesus. It is good to take refuge in you. In this sanctuary, we call upon your name today and say and sing and shout, Hosanna, God, save us. And in Jesus' life and suffering and death, may we know 
your saving goodness. As we begin this Holy Week together, help our thoughts and actions to focus upon your compassionate love and forgiving grace in Jesus Christ. Demonstrate for us today how Jesus calls us to a life of shalom and flourishing for us, though for all. In worship, may we find refuge, peace, and know that you hear every cry of our heart. In worship also, melt our hearts for the suffering of this world, for all who are in bondage. Call us toward means of refuge for them. For all who are oppressed, call us toward paths of peace for them. For all whose voices are silenced, call us toward speaking out for their voices to be heard. Even as we pray the words of Jesus, may we see his prayer as a reminder to open our eyes to the grand vision of your kingdom on earth as it already is in heaven. And so show us again how this hour is not just for us and our relationship with you, as important as that is, but also for our neighbors in need, both nearby and on the other side of the globe. And so hear us as we say together, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our reader this Palm Sunday is Barb. Instead of a psalm reading today, a poem by the Anglican priest, songwriter, and poem, Malcolm Geit. The poem, fittingly, is called Palm Sunday and is a thoughtful consideration of some of the mixed emotions we probably all have on this Sunday before Good Friday and Easter. Now to the gate of Jerusalem, the seething holy city of my heart, the Savior comes. But will I welcome him? Oh, crowds of easy feelings make a start. They raise their hands, get caught up in the singing, and think the battle won. Too soon, they'll find the challenge, the reversal he is bringing. Changes their tune, I know what lies behind, I know what lies behind the surface. Flourish that so quickly fades. Self-interest and fearful guardedness. The hardness of the heart, its barricades. And at the core, the dreadful emptiness of a perverted temple. Jesus, come break my resistance and make me your home. And we stand again to sing number 220, My Song is Love Unknown.
Please be seated. I'd like to invite uh, anyone wanting to come forward for children's time. Please do so at this point. And for today, I could use a few people who might feel childlike today because we need a, a few more than, that are coming forward. So any that feel childlike today, and don't worry, I won't embarrass you, but I'm looking for a, a few more people to uh, come join at the front. With Maeve. Um, yeah, yes, Denise, childish counts as well. Come on forward. Excellent. Perfect. Oh, and I forgot to tell you to bring your palm branches. Uh, some of you did. That's really key to what we're doing. Very important. Oh, excellent. Great. So I said at the beginning of the service already that we'll say a little bit more about this whole idea of Palm Sunday. What's it all about? Some of us know, but for others it might be fairly new, and some of us we just might forget what Palm Sunday is about. Anybody just want to tell me, first of all, why do we wave the branches? What happens on Palm Sunday? We're going to read about it a little bit later on. Jesus, on the day that we call Palm Sunday now because of the palms, walked into Jerusalem the week before his death, and people were rejoicing. They were very happy that Jesus was coming into the city of Jerusalem, and so they put palm branches in their hands and they waved them and some of them put palm branches on the ground and some of them even took their, their cloaks off, their outerwear off and laid it on the ground in front of him. Why? Because what did people do in the olden days? Why did people put their cloaks down and why did people lay a path for somebody that was coming into town? so that that person's feet didn't have to touch the ground, because why? What was so special about this person that was coming into town? They were royalty. And usually, this person would come into town, not just with their feet, but they would come into town upon a beautiful horse. We're going to read the story a little bit later on, but what does Jesus come into town with. Comes into town not on a beautiful tall horse, but on a donkey. And the reading that we're going to have from the gospel according to Mark, Mark, even different than the three other gospels, says not only a donkey, but a young colt. So a very small animal. Why do you think Jesus would come into town on a young colt instead of a tall horse. Because he didn't think he was royalty? Okay. Yeah, anybody else? Not saying it's wrong. To demonstrate humility that the kind of royalty maybe that Jesus was portraying or wanted to show was not the kind of royalty that people were so used to. Yes? And it was a donkey that had never been ridden. It was also a donkey that had never been ridden. What do you think that was about, Linda? That it had a special purpose? It had a very, very special purpose, that's right. That this donkey was set aside, this young colt was set aside specifically for Jesus. And what does it tell us about Jesus' humility? What did Jesus do, even in his whole life, to show and to teach about humility? And what, did he te what does 
if you want to call him, if we want to call him King Jesus, how does King Jesus want us to follow him? Mm -hmm. Jesus always went to the, the places where others might not go. He went to people who were not treated well by others in society. That's what Jesus, King Jesus, calls us to do as well. Now, there's one more thing that I want to talk with you about just briefly, is that when the people were shouting... Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They said a word as well, didn't they? Um, what's that word? We even sang it in our first hymn. Hosanna. Hosanna. Right. And what does Hosanna mean? Save us. Yeah, it's, it's save us, actually. Sometimes we think it means praise. That would be hallelujah. Right? But in this case, it's Hosanna, where the people are shouting, save us. And I think that's so important because, especially for people of faith, we need to be reminded that we're not just called to call other people to know who Jesus is so they can be saved, but we're even on Palm Sunday today. No matter how long we've been a Christian, no, long, no matter how good of a Christian we might think we are, we're saying it too. God save us. We need to be saved. That's why Jesus comes into the world. And Jesus, on this Palm Sunday, reminds us in so many different ways what he's about to do on the cross. And we're going to, for those of you who are able to be with us for Good Friday, we're going to learn more about um, what happens Good Friday and how important it is for us to remember Jesus' suffering and death as well. But for today, we're going to be reminding ourselves that the King of Glory comes. And that's our next song. And the song is printed in our programs. I should have asked all of you to bring your program as well. But here's what I'm hoping you'll do, is that as we're singing this song, if you have a program, or even if you don't, um, if you could march around the church as if, and I'll lead you, I'll lead you all, all right? We'll march around the church, and if any of you who are sitting as well, you can join us because we're going to continue on the Palm Sunday theme of waving our branches. The King of glory comes, the nation rejoices, open the gates before him, lift up your voices. Let's rise, let's sing. If you'd like to join us in marching, please do. So we, sorry, we're experiencing technical difficulties with the organ, actually. <laughs> Bear with me for a second.
God. Please be seated. Let's pray together, and then Barb will offer our Old and New Testament readings, and Sunday school will begin. Let's pray. God in heaven, thank you for the gift of your son Jesus. Thank you for the way in which Jesus shows us he is king, different than any prince or king or queen, showing true humility, showing relief for captives, for being with those who are oppressed, for caring for those in need. Help us this Palm Sunday to know that we are also called to follow in the way of Jesus in humble obedience and help us to know that we too are in need of Jesus' salvation. In his name we pray. Amen. You're off to Sunday school and Barb will lead us in our readings. Our reading from the Old Testament today is only two short verses. They are words which surely at least some in early Christian communities pondered when reflecting upon Jesus' entry to Jerusalem on what we call Palm Sunday. It tells a victory for the Hebrew people, though already then in a procession odd in its apparent triumph. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you, triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. He will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off and he shall command peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Moving to the New Testament, all four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, tell the story of Palm Sunday. This year, we are reading Mark's version found on page 47 of the New Testament part of our Bibles. The congregation is invited to open the Bible to Mark chapter 11 and be ready to read the words from, of the crowd from verses 9 and 10 after I have said, those who followed were shouting. Now, don't be shy. Speak the words joyfully waving your palm branches again if you wish. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the village ahead of you and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say, the Lord needs it and we'll send it back immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside the street, in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? They told him what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. 
Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Barb. Where are you in the crowd? Crowds can be great, though large groups can also be dangerous. Tonight, I am planning to be in a crowded hockey arena to watch my favorite team, the Edmonton Oilers. <laughs> Sorry, Senator fans, though you see what I mean? Crowds can turn. Christians learn this week again that principle. Palm Sunday can be a mixed bag of emotions, especially when we think of the stories which follow this. There's a story of a little child at church on Palm Sunday morning who didn't know what all the excitement was about, and the child is told by their enthusiastic parents that when the service starts, people will be waving palms. To which the child replies, what else would they wave with? You have to wonder, though, as Jesus was riding into Jerusalem that week before his destiny on what we call Good Friday, even if he was doing anything resembling a royal wave, could a few of them in that crowd maybe have noticed he wasn't really into it? Might at least the disciples start seeing his growing sadness, apprehension, or even steel determination to go forward, crowd-pleasing or not, with what he knew was lying ahead. Now, sorry to rain on our Palm Sunday parade, but that's a problem of this special day in the Christian calendar. Palm Sunday can be a bag of mixed emotions. On the one hand, with that crowd in Jerusalem, we join in celebrating Jesus for who he is. Hosanna, we say, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We know, though, with Jesus coming is also his destiny on Good Friday. And in some ways, these mixed emotions, seemingly contradictions, is kind of like life how we live it, too, isn't it? Don't you find, even mixed among your greatest moments, there are corners, too, of sadness and pain, if you're really honest? When some suggest that everything comes up roses for them, we just have to know it really isn't always so. Honest people living in Hollywood, for example, will tell you that the glamour of that town's veneer is a bit thin and easy to see through. Social media can be so tempting to portray a crowd-pleasing profile. Maybe you know some friends who appear to have their lives all put together, prim, proper, and popular. Don't be fooled by all the best ever vacation photos. And the people who post top Wordle scores, they don't win every day. There is no marriage made in heaven. I tell people in pre-marriage sessions, if a couple tells you they've never had an argument in their marriage, there's at least two possible explanations. One spouse is lying, or one of them is a doormat for the other. 
and there's no perfect church. And if someone somehow thinks they found one, my advice is this. Find another one as quick as you possibly can because there's probably stories you're not being told just yet. The truth is, no matter what crowd we're parts of, all of us have battle scars, blemishes, war wounds. We all have debts, trespasses, and sins. In the middle of this Palm Sunday-like problem, though, there is a promise. There's a God who demonstrates so much love to this world in the human face and body of Jesus. By entering not just into the glorious Jerusalem parade that day, but into the dirt, the grime and pain of everyday life. To die on a cross, to suffer for all the sin, debts, trespasses of you and me, of this whole world. And this is how and why we can sing Hosanna with joy and hope for ourselves, for others, for the world that God loves. There is a, a copper etching by the 17th century Dutch artist Rembrandt called The Three Crosses, focusing on Jesus Christ at Golgotha. In it, Rembrandt has facial expressions of many of the people in the crowd that day. There's concerned family, there's anxious onlookers, there's guarded soldiers, some angry Pharisees and scribes. Some, seeing enough, turn away. If you don't know that etching, have a look for it. It's easy to find online. People have imagined finding themselves in that crowd. Who and where might they have been? On the etching's left edge, there is an anguished figure kneeling. Many art critics suggest that Rembrandt has painted himself there onto the scene in recognition of his confession that he helped to nail Jesus to the cross and his faith and trust that by Jesus' wounds, he is healed. Where might you be in the crowd? Where might you see yourself if you were there as Jesus entered Jerusalem or on that cross? It can be great to feel part of a group, though it's important, isn't it, to know what crowd you're in and where you are what you're representing. There are lots of crowds lately protesting various wars and conflicts around the globe. And some people do suggest caution in picking sides with any of these conflicts. Nobel Peace Prize winner Desmond Tutu, who knew a few things about conflict, said this. If you are neutral, in situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. There were big crowds last week and even yesterday in our country, remembering a former prime minister who had quite a following in his heyday. And also, as the honest journalists reported, more than a few falling outs. But in addition to stories about reconciling past differences, which were heartwarming, what was likely the most telling narrative, whether you preferred Brian Mulroney's political leanings or not, was how in personal and in professional life, his values representing something bigger than himself or pleasing the crowd. More than two decades ago, I was in a crowded concert for a solo performance by one of my favorite singer-songwriters, Bruce Coburn. 
Throughout the evening, one fan kept calling for one of Bruce's most popular songs, Rocket Launcher. A pretty violent protest song, for some of you who will remember it, composed as a critique against injustices that he saw happening in 1980s Central America. It's probably one of Coburn's more popular songs. And singing it that evening might have been a real cloud crowd pleaser. After the seventh, I think, call for rocket launcher at the Windspear Center in Edmonton, Bruce finally stopped. And he addressed the vocal fan and the rest of us that evening in November of 2001. He said, you know, there was an appropriate time for that song though just two months after 9-11. This one's taking a back seat. Right there was why I knew I, why I liked Bruce. Yes, for his great songwriting, superb acoustic guitar plucking and raspy voice. Though as much, even more, for his integrity and not giving in to popularity. There was a lesson in crowd mentality this past week as well when we learned about the health condition of a very popular Princess of Wales. For weeks, not only tabloids, but many people on social media and other means of gossip were getting on bandwagons, voicing misinformed and too often less than kind opinions. Crowds, you see, can be easy to get lost in. Some can bring us to dark places. In all large groups, there are loyalists to a cause for good or ill, some who simply tag along, and there are troublemakers in every group. And some of this must have been happening in Jesus last week as well. Jesus demonstrates his awareness of crowd mentality as he pushes forward not to please and to be popular, very purposefully to bring peace between heaven and earth. As Mark tells it, Jesus is very intentional about every step, no matter what anyone in the crowd or elsewhere might say or do. Jesus says, go into the village. And immediately, as you enter it, you'll find a colt, never ridden yet. Untie it and bring it. And if anyone says, why are you doing this, tell them the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back immediately. And because everything else goes exactly as Jesus says it will, I like to imagine someone in Jerusalem once owned a pretty famous and popular donkey. All goes as Jesus says. Though Mark doesn't say much about Jesus' response at all. Except after entering the city, he goes almost peacefully to the temple. And it says in Mark 11, he looked around at everything. I wonder what he all looked at. I wonder what he all saw before him. In Luke's version of the story, there is a bit more emotion. It says in Luke, as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. And he said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace. But now it is hidden from your eyes. It is as if Jesus, fully human and divine, looks upon the crowd, deeply wanting, to the, wanting the crowd to know the peace that he can and that he will bring. The peace that was prophesied about already in the time of Zechariah. Salman Rushdie, acclaimed and infamous author, 
wrote an article for the New Yorker last fall, If Peace Were a Prize, making a good case for being in the right crowd, but for the right reasons. To aspire for justice and shalom for all. He wrote, what do we do about free speech when it is so widely abused? We should still do with renewed vigor what we have always needed to do to answer bad speech with better speech, to counter false narratives with better narratives, to answer hate with love, and to believe that the truth can still succeed even in an age of lies. We must defend it fiercely and define it as broadly as possible. Jesus, after entering the temple, looks at everything. And though he could have gone for a victory lap on that colt, Mark says it was already late. And he went to be with his disciples because it was his time for destiny. Crowds can be great, though it depends what group you're in, right? During this Holy Week, maybe it's good to ask, what sort of circles are you drawn into? Are you aware of whom you're following? Are you easily swayed from one group to the next? Do you know which causes are worthy to follow? Are you making a difference to bring the kind of peace that Jesus speaks of and dies for. Oliver Cromwell was a political leader of the 17th century who knew about crowd psychology and once said to a friend, do not trust the cheering for those persons would shout as much if you and I were about to be hanged. I imagine Jesus was aware of this long before. Where are you in the crowd? Amen. We sing in response number 760. As we rise, we sing all of the stanzas.
be seated. This week is the Easter blood drive. Two weeks ago, Linda Paul, who is part of our church here, gave a, um, a spirited announcement about why it's important uh, to uh, donate blood and plasma, not only because it helps Linda herself so much, but also many people in our city and across the country. The video that was uh, created um, by Canada Blood Service about Linda was sent to people at Knox. I hope you received it. I hope you had a chance to look at it. I hope it also maybe encouraged you to donate blood or plasma. Perhaps share it with others around you this week. Before our prayer time, uh, just to remind everybody that this coming week, we have our Monday Thursday service at 7.30 p.m., including communion. And then on Friday morning is our Good Friday Remembrance at 10.30 a.m. And then, of course, uh, Easter Sunday morning, as usual, 10.30 a.m. And don't forget about our Easter Monday service as well. Just seeing if you're listening. <laughs> I hope you can come to at least a couple of those services. Maundy Thursday will be more reflective. Good Friday will be quite somber. Easter Sunday morning, we hope, will be joyful. Please come. Let's pray. Lord God in heaven, we give you thanks for this opportunity to worship you this morning, and we pray your blessing upon all of us as we reflect upon your sacrifice this coming week. We ask God for meaningful times of worship on Thursday, on Friday, and next Sunday. We live in a world where there is much brokenness, where there is also much pomp and ceremony, sometimes in denial of the brokenness that is all around us. We pray, God, for healing in this world, for healing in our land, for healing in our city, in our very lives. We continue to pray for the situation in Gaza. We pray for a ceasefire, for an end to the bloodshed, to the horrors of war. And we pray the same for Ukraine and the concerns between Ukraine and Russia. And this day, this week, we do pray also for all of the people in Russia who have been so severely affected by the terrorist attack at the concert hall. Comfort all who mourn, we pray. We thank you for the ways in which in this church community we can offer some sense of solace and peace and hope for people in need. And so we thank you for the meal that was provided last evening again. We thank you for all of the volunteers. And we pray that you would continue to be near to all of the over 100 guests who attended again last evening. Bless our community of faith. Be with those who are lonely. May they find fellowship. Be with those who are ill. We pray for recovery and healing. With those who grieve, we pray for comfort. And we pray that not only from you, but that these may come from within our hearts for one another comfort, healing, fellowship. We pray, Lord God, that you would now in our time of worship, of giving of the first fruits that you've given to us, that you'd not only help us to be generous, but also see that this is an important part of our desire and commitment to follow Jesus 
as our Savior, as our Lord and King. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Simone will lead us in offertory music, and then as he does, if you haven't already done so in some other way, either online by e-transfer or otherwise, or already offered your commitment at the entrance, an usher will be coming forward up the aisle from the front to the back, and if you would like to uh, offer your commitment, there are envelopes uh, in the uh, church pews. Within your bulletins this week, there was also an envelope specifically for Easter. There's a reason for that because it used to be in the olden days, everybody would be getting a box of envelopes. Since the pandemic, more of you are giving online, more of you are giving electronically or in different ways. And this is just simply a reminder to be generous during the Easter season especially as well. God bless you with your commitment to be generous. At the close of the uh, offertory, we will stand to sing, Praise God from whom all blessings flow. So, Lord God, we give you thanks and we pray your blessing upon these gifts that we offer in gratitude, our commitment to follow Jesus, to walk humbly with our God, to seek mercy, to offer justice to all in need, both nearby and far away. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 214.
If you have time today, please join us for Coffee Fellowship in Geneva Hall to my left at the front of the sanctuary to your right. Uh, please join us if you can. And go in peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you, be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you all and all in your encircle God's peace.